So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Stoke Mandeville Plastic Surgery Educational Series. And, and thank you for joining us, over 200 of you registered from around the globe. So please jot down your name and where you're dialing from in the chat function. It'll be lovely to see, um, see who you are. And throughout this session, we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. And do put these down in the Q&A function at the bottom right of your screens. So today it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Mark Swan, who will tell us all about robotic cleft surgery within the hour. Mark is a consultant plastic and cleft surgeon at the Spire Cleft Center at the John Ratcliffe Hospital. He, he's also a pioneer and pusher of boundaries. In addition to robotic cleft surgery, Mark, together with Tim Goodacre and Jan Chinuska, a material scientist at Oxford, has developed an intelligent hydrogel tissue expander to treat cleft palates. But even more than this, Mark is an exceptionally caring surgeon who's also a very gifted and fantastic teacher. And I was lucky enough to be his registrar several years ago, and he made the vast topic of cleft lip and palate understandable and manageable for me. So thank you very much, Mark. Um, welcome and thank you for your time today uh, um, during your leave. So Mark will speak to us for about 45 minutes or so. And after this, we'll have, we have a special guest, Mr. Tim Goodacre, join us to host the 15 minute question and answer session afterwards. Now, many of you already know who Tim is. He's a recently retired consultant plastic and cleft surgeon at Oxford, ex-president of BATPRAS, and now vice president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. So thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Mark, please. Well, thank you, James. That's a, a very kind uh, introduction. Of course, it's a pleasure uh, to be here this morning and to have such a global uh, audience and uh, perhaps this is one of the silver linings of COVID is that it's um, really spurned um, people along uh, to have such webinars and this will probably be a taste of things to come as I think surgical meetings and conferences were, as we were previously used to won't be happening uh, for some time yet. So firstly um, I just want to uh, clarify one thing and that's uh, that robotic surgery is largely a misnomer. These aren't robots that we're dealing with, and that's because they're not truly autonomous. Um, of course, robotic surgery sounds sexy, which is why it's got some traction in the literature, but really at best, we're talking about robot-assisted surgery um, because the surgeon always remains in control. Uh, now, I am not a, an Isaac Asimov when it comes to robots, um, and we, in Oxford came to this very much via a, a sort of cleft centric um, uh, approach. Um, uh, and I hope over the next 45 minutes to give you some indication as to how we uh, uh, developed uh, the robotics program. And for that, of course, I have to thank a huge uh, team, many of whom are with us today. Uh, Tom Dobbs um, uh, is in Swansea. He's just defended his PhD successfully and is, and is a trainee uh, in Wales. Uh, Kuram Khan uh, is a consultant in Birmingham who trained in Oxford and I'm very grateful uh, uh, to him for his input. It's his birthday so his wife has other plans for him today. Uh, Tim Goodacre uh, is with us uh, and he's already been introduced. He's uh, my mentor uh, in cleft and is uh, largely the reason why I'm sitting here today uh, talking about this subject. And of course there are other members of the team. Viv is our long-suffering anaesthetist and Carrie Luscombe is our principal speech therapist who uh, compiled the speech outcome data. So as cleft surgeons, we are all very much aware that there are many challenges in our field. And one of those challenges, which I think robotics can uh, potentially address is that of our access and the very confined 3D space within which we operate. Of course, there are some patients, particularly the syndromic ones, who have additional factors such as trismus or, or, or a very small mandible that makes access even more challenging. And we have learned over, over recent years that we wish to avoid lim uh, the hyperextension of the child's neck interoperatively as this does have significant uh, uh, potential risks. Particularly when it comes to secondary surgery, enlarged tonsils, for example, can also hinder our access to the surgical field. And this again may uh, offer some uh, uh, additional benefit for a robotics approach. Now, I think it's really important that before we start talking about robotics, we have to acknowledge 
where we are and what in the United Kingdom, at least, is the gold standard uh, for cleft surgery, and that is the use of the operating microscope. And uh, Brian Summerlad um, uh, uh, is very much um, uh, to credit for this. He's used the operating microscope uh, since 1991 and has really been instrumental, I think, in, in, um, in championing its use, um, both within the United Kingdom and across the world. And certainly the microscope gives excellent visualization adequate magnification and also ergonomically for the surgeon it allows you to operate if you set up correctly in a very um, uh, 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 comfortable position for the surgeon uh, with your head in neutral if you have the scope properly aligned and also it allows the child's head uh, to be largely in a in a near neutral uh, uh, position. I don't want to dwell on occupational risks but as cleft surgeons we all know colleagues uh, who have chronic neck pain, who have had neck surgery uh, uh, for disc issues related uh, to um, cleft surgery and a lifetime of cleft surgery. And I think all of us need to think about how we best visualize the palate. And I recognize that loops internationally is probably the most common approach, but I strongly feel that this is not best um, if not for the patient, certainly for the surgeon, and particularly when you're trying to look at and access the anterior hard palate, that does inevitably require a lot of neck flexion and craning on account of the surgeon, which I think does store up pro problems long term. Um, and that's not to say issues aren't there with bone grafts and primary lip repairs, etc. But I think it's particularly pertinent uh, for cleft surgery. And prismatic loops have, have come onto the field and there was a, a very good paper by this Chinese group that I, I urge you to read. Uh, Philip Chen in, in, uh, in Taiwan first introduced uh, uh, me to these and a lot of people now use them and they essentially have a 90 degree angle on you and they allow you to operate uh, with your neck in neutral, but uh, looking down uh, orthogonally at the palate. But for, for, for certainly British surgeons uh, and an ever increasing number of international surgeons, I still believe that the operating microscope is the gold standard against which any other newer technology uh, must be uh, compared. So for um, this is a picture of a submucous cleft palate on the left. It's got all the classic uh, uh, signs. Uh, this is the levator reconstruction here. This was done using a, 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 a summer lab technique uh, with an operating microscope. And it would be very similar appearance if this was a primary overt cleft palate. And for me, um, I think this approach is hard uh, to beat and many of you who use this approach and are familiar with it um, will feel very comfortable uh, with this um, uh, uh, approach to cleft surgery. Now, of course, it's different when you're looking further back into the pharynx. It's a smaller space. It's more cramped. You've got tonsils in the way, the velum's in the way. For us, and for me, that was a, 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 a initially a lower hanging fruit scenario where surgery is even harder to do with a scope or with loops. So I just want to spend a few minutes introducing the uh, Da Vinci system. This is other systems are available. Uh, it's not the only show in town, but it's certainly the, the sort of Hamilton or the uh, Phantom of the Opera. This is, this is the main game. Uh, um, and there have been well in excess of six million cases uh, performed to date. The majority tend to be for gynae and neurological procedures. Uh, but of course, it's been used across all um, uh, surgical specialties. There are over 5,000 Da Vinci robots in use worldwide. Uh, with the majority just about being in the United States and 44,000 surgeons have been trained in using uh, uh, the robot technology. When it comes to intraoral surgical use, the doyen is Greg Weinstein um, and um, Bert O'Malley, who are based in Philadelphia, and that's where we did our, our training in Oxford. Um, th that team have done well in excess of 3,000 cases and I, I, and I think are, are, are very much the global leaders in terms of head and neck cancer surgery. Um, in Oxford, um, the mantle was taken by my ENT colleagues, Stuart Winter and Priest Silver, and they've done in the order of 100 cases. So we're very much 
earlier on in, in the learning curve in Oxford. The system we had in Oxford uh, was the SI system. We also have the newer XI system. The cost for this is about two million uh, US dollars, uh, which is significant, but not outrageous uh, uh, in terms of global healthcare costs. Uh, the latest um, Da Vinci system is the single port of the SP system, which I'll just show you a glimpse of, of uh, 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 momentarily. So in terms of primary cleft surgery, there is really one uh, uh, leader in this field, and that's Nasser Hajmi, who's based at uh, the University of Antwerp. Um, many of us in the UK will be very familiar with Nasser's work. He came to present at the uh, Craniofacial Society meeting when it was held in Newcastle. Um, and he's also spoke at uh, various European and global meetings. And he um, has only actually published the one paper so far, which was in the Cleft Palette Journal uh, four years ago. And I urge you all to, to uh, read this paper as it is a, a very much a seminal work. Uh, his uh, patient group was uh, uh, comprising 10 patients with a mixed phenotype of clefts, uh, but they're all primary cases. They're all roughly nine months of age, as they would be in the UK for primary cleft repair. And he compared these, this group of 10 patients with 30 controls who he repaired using his standard fashion, uh, which was uh, with a similar, uh, I beg your pardon, with a, uh, a furlough, uh, uh, a modified furlough approach and using loops. In the 10 patient um, um, experimental group, he used a, a hybrid approach. So he used loops to stitch up at the end because that's quicker. Um, but for the dissection, the muscle dissection, he used the Da Vinci SI system. Not surprisingly, as this was his first 10 patients, uh, his operative time was significantly increased um, from a mean of 87 uh, minutes uh, in the loop only group, as it were, to um, uh, uh, 122 minutes uh, in the group of 10 robotic patients. Um, but of course, that was his early learning curve, and he's done many hundreds of these now, and his operative time is, it has significantly come down, as one would anticipate. He reported no um, uh, immediate or early complications in either group uh, by the time of the six-month follow-up. But what NASA hasn't published, and I really think that this is critical if we're going to take robotics further in terms of primary surgery, what he hasn't published is his speech data. And that, of course, we are eagerly awaiting. Now, why that is important for me is that our benchmark, certainly in the United Kingdom, has been the Brian Summerlad approach uh, using his repair uh, and the microscope. And the speech uh, data that Brian publishes is, of course, extremely good. And that has to be what we're aiming for. And I think if we're to change practice, we need to get results uh, equaling or hopefully bettering uh, uh, Brian's results if we're going to take primary surgery further. The situation in Oxford was slightly peculiar because our Da Vinci system is has been paid for by the urological surgeons and that system is based at the adult cancer hospital and of course cleft surgery is in the pediatric children's hospital uh, on two different geographical sites so when we came to thinking about using the da vinci system uh, six or seven years ago uh, we recognized that initially we'd be having to use it in an adult population and therefore we weren't talking about primary repairs we were talking about secondary uh, cleft surgery uh, and that being uh, uh, fringoplasty and still in oxford as in many uh, uk units uh, we favor the heinz fringoplasty and this is an image from from uh, heinz's uh, uh, original paper published in 1950 and many surgeons on this on this webinar will be using a heinz or a similar approach and they will be needing to split um, uh, the soft palate in order to get access to the posterior pharyngeal wall. And of course, that comes with it uh, an associated morbidity and potential delays in recovery. And we're hoping that we could circumvent some of these requirements by um, uh, taking a robotic approach. So this is the Da Vinci uh, system. Uh, this is the SI system. The XI system is very similar, um, uh, except the instruments are slightly more streamlined and it's a bit, it's a bit slicker, uh, but ostensibly they are, are very similar. The fundamental thing, for those of you who aren't familiar with robotics, is that one has a console surgeon 
uh, who is sitting at the um, 3D uh, um, uh, interface. This can be in the same operating theater. It could be on a separate continent. Um, and it's interesting how this developed um, from uh, American military uh, use originally. And one has um, a assistant surgeon, uh, and here uh, are Kurum's hands here, uh, who's sitting at the head of the patient uh, when it comes to robotic cleft surgery, and who's very much protecting the patient and making sure that everything runs smoothly at the cold face. Obviously, the operating surgeon doesn't, uh, at the console doesn't need to be scrubbed. Um, and you can adjust the console so that you're in a very comfortable ergonomic uh, position. The, um, uh, on the operating side here, you can see you have the central uh, 3D camera. And these blue instruments here and here um, are the, um, uh, have the long uh, uh, telescopic arms that enter into the patient's oral cavity. And these instruments contain the endorist. And the endorist is an astonishing uh, piece of technology. And it really is um, uh, uh, very uh, impressive to see, certainly for the first time. And these, these wrists allow four degrees of movement. So those of you who are familiar with aviation uh, uh, will be familiar with pitch, uh, yaw and roll, uh, which effectively give you the X, Y, Z coordinates of the tip of your instruments. The fourth dimension is of course the grip. Now, the important thing about grip is that you're not getting haptic feedback like one would in ordinary surgery. What you are relying on are the visual cues of you overstretching or perhaps over crushing tissues. And certainly that is a very important part in the learning curve of robotic surgery that one becomes um, uh, competent at recognizing these subtle cues because of the lack of physical feedback. Now, <clears throat> of course, the excitement having seen these endo wrists, which are far more capable than the surgeon's wrist, which can only pronate and supinate, have to be tempered against the potential risks of surgery. And that has been well publicized both here and, and overseas. And uh, for those of you interested in this, I, I very much um, draw you towards this FDA review from a few years back, which is, which is really interesting reading and is probably true to any new surgical technology, whether it's laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery. And of course, there are degrees of risk and most of the deaths uh, that are occurred or have occurred and are occurring in robotic surgery, of course, apply to the high risk procedures such as the uh, cardiac surgical uh, uh, cases, rather than the transoral robotic surgery from head and neck, uh, from the head and neck sphere. Um, but I won't dwell on this, but it certainly makes very interesting uh, reading. So what do we want to look at? Well, is it, is it safe? Is it, is it feasible to do robotic surgery uh, in uh, a clinical scenario? How on earth does one become competent at a new technique using the robot? How long does it take? Does it work? And what does it cost? So the feasibility um, study, uh, as I've already mentioned, was very much using the uh, adult um, secondary speech surgery uh, approach. Um, we had to convince our um, new technologies group at the hospital that this uh, was safe uh, from an ethical standpoint. And therefore, the feasibility study had a number of prongs to it. And I, um, uh, if you're interested in any further reading, then Curum's paper, uh, which was in conjunction with, with Tom Dobbs and Tim, uh, is well worth reading because it's a nice story as to how uh, uh, one goes down this pathway. And we started with a simple pediatric mannequin. We went on to using uh, human cadavers and a live porcine model. And it, uh, uh, it's really interesting to follow a, a concept from, uh, um, from, from paper to, to, to a clinical study. Since we published that paper, um, the Toronto group at Sick Kids, so Dale Podolsky together with um, uh, Chris Forrest and, and David Fisher, have uh, written up an excellent uh, paper in PRS, which I urge that you read. This is using their Simulaire cleft palette um, model, and they use both the DaVinci SI and the XI uh, systems 
uh, and compared their use uh, for their uh, cleft palate repair. And that, that um, very much uh, replicates a lot of uh, what we did and they really took a very elegant approach to assessing uh, its outcome. So this um, was our paediatric airway mannequin, mannequin uh, study. Um, here at the console, you have Tim Goodacre. Uh, the mannequin is on the operating table. And what we were doing here is simply figuring out how on earth do you fit the console, the robot, um, the scrub nurse, the assistant surgeon, and the anaesthetist in the room. So this was getting the feng shui of everything in the right position and really just getting used to what instruments we would need in order to do uh, the surgery. Here we've got some scissors uh, on the right hand side here and this is a needle driver as the Americans like to call it on the left hand side and this was very much exploratory in terms of um, uh, using these very fine instruments within uh, a, a limited 3D space of the paediatric uh, mannequin. The cadaveric model was undertaken uh, with Greg Weinstein uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, this model uh, was invaluable, really. You can see here much in the previous, uh, in relation to the previous image I showed you, this is the camera. Here are our instruments. Here we, there is a capability for three arms, but here we're just using two arms. And the uh, gag is in sight you here with the patient. Here's the light from the camera and the two surgical uh, instruments are here and here. Um, this was our first attempt at actually undertaking a Heinz fringoplasty. Of course, we have the huge benefit of uh, a non-bleeding cadaver. Um, it does produce smoke and um, your assistant, you are quite dependent on your assistant to help evacuate that smoke with a sucker. The Da Vinci doesn't come with a sucker. Um, and here we are using a monopolar diathermy. There is no bipolar diathermy with the Da Vinci. And we're dissecting and raising the right side of Heinz flap. And you can use the tip of the monopolar to help sweep in that pre-vertebral fascia plane. And actually it's a very elegant way. And certainly when you see Greg Weinstein um, uh, do this, uh, both with the cadaver and, and in his clinical cases. I mean, he, it is beautiful uh, to see the, the dexterity that you get with, with um, familiarity with this instrument. On the left hand side here, um, the Maryland forceps are being used to hold the flap as we're raising the left sided flap. Now there is no haptic feedback, so it is quite easy to crush flaps and crush tissue. So you do have to be careful. There isn't a skin hook um, option, as we all love in, in plastic surgery, but that doesn't exist with the Da Vinci robot. So you have to get used to a whole new way of operating. So again, the left hand uh, flap um, is raised here, and now we are suturing closed the donor sites. Now what's interesting with robotic surgery is that most robotic surgery, if you look at gynae or, or, or urological surgery, most of it, and, and head and neck surgery for that matter, most of it is ablative. You're, you're cutting out primary tumors, removing prostates, using your monopolar diathermy. There is relatively little stitching. And certainly when you're rookies like we were, stitching with the robot, and here we're using two uh, needle drivers, um, is quite tricky. And there is certainly a learning curve associated with this. And Heinz fringoplasties are about the section, but they are largely about insetting your flaps and about stitching. So actually, um, and I'll come on to this later, the stitching is the sort of Achilles heel of this operation. So the better you'll get at, you're, you're at, at stitching uh, with the robot, uh, the quicker your operation is. But here we are insetting both hinds flaps, just uh, cranial uh, to uh, the arch of uh, C1. And uh, it's worth noting here, I'm just dabbing away with the swab there. And you can see there are the hinds flaps. And if you uh, release um, the uvula, uh, which was previously attached to a, um, uh, a catheter, um, the Heinz flaps are in a fairly um, uh, pleasing position. So I'm going to give you the data here for our first five um, robotic Heinz fingerplasty cases. 
They were all adults. They were, again, a, a variety of, of cleft phenotypes, including more non-cleft uh, patients. And they all had in common on the lateral video fluoroscopy, they had a mild to moderate gap between the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall. And they all had posteriorly um, sighted levators. So they did not need um, a re repair uh, to uh, optimize their levator position that had either already been done or was not necessary. And what they needed was a modest Heinz flap in order to uh, uh, reduce that um, uh, velar pharyngeal port uh, defect. Now, um, <clears throat> I've talked about there being three arms uh, to the Da Vinci. We only use two arms largely because the third arm becomes quite cluttered. And what one is trying to avoid is collisions interoperatively, collisions between instruments and the camera, and more importantly, collisions between the instruments and the patient's mouth and teeth. So we actually only use two arms in all of our um, uh, procedures, and we interchange between these instruments. So we use two eight mil needle drivers, which are um, these instruments here, if you can see them, my mouse. Um, you also have five mil uh, needle drivers, which of course in a pediatric setting uh, are um, uh, an advantage. At the moment, the XI system, the latest system uses eight mil instruments, not, not five mil instruments, I hasten to add. The um, uh, Maryland forceps um, are effectively your skin hook. You can use them as a rake. Uh, to retract tissue, uh, as well as holding uh, the tissue flaps. And as I said, this is your monopolar tip. Uh, there is no bipolar, so certainly um, uh, that may be uh, uh, of interest for you if you're particularly if you're doing primary surgery. Um, uh, and you have to get used to the fact that there is no 15 blade. I do all of my primary levator dissection uh, uh, using uh, a beaver blade or 15 blade uh, and I use bipolar diathermy. So this is a real uh, a sea change in, in approach. We've talked about the lack of haptic feedback and the importance of visual feedback uh, uh, and picking up those very subtle cues and that interaction between the console surgeon and the secondary surgeon who's at the patient's head is really critical uh, uh, to, uh, in my view, to the success of the surgery. The camera is a, an astounding piece of technology. Uh, it's a 3D camera, and there is a zero degree camera, which we use to raise the flaps because they're sitting there right ahead of you on the posterior pharyngeal wall. But for insetting the flaps, we use a 30 degree camera in the sort of reverse setting. So you're looking up, you're looking uh, cranially under the soft palate. And you just, unfortunately, from the video that I'm about to show you, you can't appreciate that 3D view that you're afforded uh, with this camera on a simple video. You do have to be sitting at the console and to be seeing it in, in real time. And it is, it is really quite spectacular. <clears throat> we also use something called the Alexis mouth guard, and I'll show you that in the next image. As with uh, most of my um, uh, uh, Heinz finger plasties, and the same applies with Tim, we try and avoid splitting the soft palate if, uh, uh, if we can. And we would try ordinarily to use a, a small Jake's catheter, pass down the nose, suture to the uvula, and then gentle retraction throughout the procedure. In patients who have um, uh, 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 perhaps larger uh, tonsils or we need a bit of retraction, we use simple uh, copper malleable retractors. So this is the rather gruesome device known as the Alexis retractor. And it's, it's, it's keeping the patient's lips well out of, uh, of uh, harm's way. The patient isn't scrubbed yet. Um, this is all part of the initial prepping once the, the patient is intubated. Um, you can see obviously in the adult, uh, as opposed to the, the um, primary uh, palate scenario, there are teeth that you must obviously respect during the operation. Uh, here um, <clears throat> we have our Dr. Kilmer gag in situ. Uh, this red um, bit in the view here is the, um, the catheter, which is retracting uh, the, uh, the uvula. This uh, blue circle here is the uh, arch of C1, and this is the right-hand uh, Heinz flap, and this is the left-hand Heinz flap. 
And here I'm relying on Kurum and Tom at the head end to retract away uh, 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 the lateral pharyngeal walls just so you can get a decent view of the uh, flaps. And, to, and obviously for orientation, here is the tongue with the tongue blade and the ET tube inside you. So I hope you've got a, uh, a sense of the view. But of course, this is the space. There aren't any robotic instruments in here. And this is the view with the robotic instrument. So you, you rapidly fill up that space. So um, here we've got our assistant. Uh, so this is either Tom or Kurum here with um, uh, holding uh, a uh, copper malleable and a sucker. There is the uh, camera, which is coming down in this angle so, and then the two instruments in parallel, one here and one here. So there really isn't much, uh, much room. Um, and you're constantly on your guard as the assistant surgeon to prevent uh, these collisions. And certainly from Dan Podolsky's work, the more um, um, uh, um, advanced version, the XI version, minimized the, the, the so-called number of collisions just because they're a little bit more streamlined in terms of the uh, instruments. So I'm now going to um, show you a short uh, video. Of course, now we've got blood. This is a live patient. We've got a lot more smoke. So you are reliant on your um, assistant to, uh, to swab and suck as necessary. We're using the monopolar here to raise down to the pre-vertebral fascia um, uh, on the right hand uh, hind flap. The rake, uh, if you like, the Maryland forceps were being used there to just put a bit of skin tension in. And now the flap is, uh, is down here, uh, sitting cranially, and we're just closing the donor site uh, cordially. And of course, um, uh, every time you get back onto the Da Vinci, it's the suturing uh, that takes a um, uh, 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 practice. And before we do every case, uh, uh, the day before we sit down with the robot and we just practice our, our, our not throwing uh, using the instrument. And I think if there's going to be one big advance uh, with robotic cleft surgery, it's going to be having an automated suturer suture delivering device uh, rather than effectively hand instrument tying uh, each knot. Uh, so for those of you out there who are looking for a research project, uh, I think that might be a very fruitful way forward. The left hand flap has been raised now and we are just closing the apex of the donor site at the, at the, uh, at the head end of the patient, at the cranial end, uh, before inserting uh, the uh, skin flaps, uh, the, the, uh, the, the hind flaps, I beg your pardon. So here we've got the right hand donor site, the left hand donor site, plenty of vital sutures there. Here are the hind flaps that are sitting just cranial to this point here, which is C1, the arch of, uh, uh, of C1. And the um, uvula is being retracted here uh, by the Jake's catheter, and that will soon be released, and the uvula will flat back, and the velum will, will then um, uh, obscure uh, your view of the Heinz flaps. So, in terms of our uh, results, the operating time, you will not be surprised to hear, was significantly longer using the robot. So, we're talking an hour to an hour and a half longer uh, than doing a standard Heinz pharyngoplasty. And of course, that has sequelae potentially in terms of tongue swelling, in terms of airway uh, complications, particularly if you're doing it in smaller children and if one was doing it in primary cleft surgery. Um, and there's no doubt that that time could be reduced by doing a hybrid approach uh, like NASA did uh, and using part, mic uh, part uh, microscope and loop or loops and part um, uh, robot. But we were pure to the robot uh, throughout the operation. All of our patients had a single uh, inpatient uh, uh, stay of one night uh, and there were no uh, complications uh, in terms of bleeds, airway or obstructive sleep apnea. The cost of these instruments is not insignificant. The instruments are not single use. They have a lockout on between 10 and 20 uses per instrument. And after um, uh, the attributed number of uses, the instrument uh, uh, must be discarded. So it works out at roughly 450 pounds, $500 per case. 
So not trivial by any means, but not astronomical, particularly if you're able to reduce uh, inpatient stay and save costs elsewhere. These are our speech results that uh, were uh, independently um, um, uh, brought together by Carrie, our speech therapist. For those of you, um, many of you will be familiar with uh, GOSPASS. This is set out in a standard fashion with the preoperative scores in the left hand purple block and the six month post op scores on the right hand side. <clears throat> uh, each horizontal row represents one patient. And I would say that this is, I mean, it's only five patients, but this is a fairly representative sample as one would expect with any Heinz uh, uh, speech surgery uh, outcome in the majority. So four out of the five patients had, I would suggest, a perfect result in terms of hypernasality, hyponasality, nasal emission and turbulence. Um, uh, one patient, the second patient uh, in this column did have some residual hypernasality um, and nasal emission, so a, a less than perfect result, but still uh, uh, near perfect intelligibility and a patient who's very happy with their outcome. So I'd say the speech outcomes uh, were very um, uh, similar with both the robot and what could be achieved with a standard um, uh, approach using either a microscope or loops. So some of our concluding remarks before we open up to questions. So from, certainly from our perspective, the technique is, is very much uh, a feasible technique for, for, um, uh, for speech surgery. There are um, logistical issues, but they can be largely overcome. I think it's very hard to, um, to move up that surgical learning curve, particularly when you're doing relatively few cases that are quite spaced apart. It's very different from someone like Weinstein, who has a, a, a robotics list every day of the week. We're doing these often months apart, so one gets rusty and one needs to re-familiarise yourself with the nuances of using a robot uh, before um, going back onto a, a, a patient setting. As I mentioned, I think the speech outcomes are comparable. Uh, what I would like to see, and I think it's very important, uh, are the outcomes from primary cleft surgery using a robotic uh, dissection. I think it's important when you're using new technology with patients that you have to have complete full disclosure with them uh, in, as part of the informed consent procedure. I've already mentioned that if someone would like to take on the mantle of a, a new suturing device, uh, uh, that would be, uh, for me, the holy grail of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pharyngeal uh, surgery, whether it's a robot or not, to be honest. Um, there are consumable cost uh, implications, uh, but they are relatively modest. Um, and we've talked about utility in primary surgery. I hope we can come back to that in our discussion, because I think uh, that's really uh, very interesting. And I very much welcome uh, views of those of you in the audience who uh, do use um, loops and scissors, for example, for your primary dissection. Uh, for those of you who have read Dale uh, Podolsky's paper in PRS, I think using uh, simulation, whether it's um, their cleft palate simulator and the robot, uh, is a great way uh, of training. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, I think there's a lot of scope uh, uh, for this uh, in uh, robotics and certainly Tom and, and others who are training uh, in cleft um, I'm sure could speak uh, to that. So I just wanted to show you this clip of the single port device we don't have this in Oxford but essentially this is a two centimeter port through which all your instruments pass so it abolishes that collision uh, situation that one gets with the SI and to a lesser extent the XI systems because you're all going through one confined space and it makes working in somewhere like the, the, the mouth or the pharynx in my view uh, a lot easier and uh, I would be very excited to, uh, to try uh, this technology um, uh, for, um, for cleft surgery because I think this definitely has uh, excellent utility. Uh, in that regard. So thank you everyone for your patience. Thank you for giving up your time uh, uh, to listen to me talk. I think we might have finished a fraction early so that hopefully will leave uh, James plenty of time uh, to open up uh, 
uh, to questions. Thank you very much, James. Mark, thank you very much. That was a brilliant, brilliant talk on robotic club surgery. I've learned so much from that. I, I think I'll, I'll let um, Tim host this session mainly, if that's okay. Brilliant, yeah. thank you. Uh, Good morning, everybody, and uh, absolutely super presentation, Mark, of, of where you've got to and, and the background of, of all this. Um, I, I very much welcome uh, queries and questions from, from around the world because it'd be fascinating to hear, hear what people are thinking and uh, whether you think this is completely for the birds or for, you know, not, not, not uh, a very niche subject, but, or whether it's something that's really got legs. Mark, you're, you're at the moment uh, very limited by technology, as you've just described at the end, and, uh, and also the cost of this as well. I, I, like, I just wonder whether you could explore a little bit about um, the stranglehold in the sense that Da Vinci has over, over this. I don't know whether we have any Da Vinci people watching <laughs> uh, members, so, so perhaps we ought to be uh, circumspect about that. But, but there are other robotic manufacturers around now aren't there and and you haven't really talked about that and and we know that robotics has been used for in in much smaller spaces and been developed by other by other manufacturers so would you like to just talk a bit about that yeah thank you tim i mean certainly you know i did say that um uh, the da vinci wasn't the only game in town but it, it it is a big player globally of course um and in a way we were influenced him uh, by using the robot by uh, Weinstein's work um, on the ENT sphere. Now, my colleague uh, uh, in ophthalmology in Oxford uh, um, has been using a robot for um, ocular surgery, and that's a completely different non-Da Vinci system. There are many, many different systems out there. Um, and one thing we know about technology is that the more we use it, the more advancements we have, the cheaper it gets. And that is the same whether you're talking about disposables from laparoscopic surgery uh, to uh, the complexities of a robotic instruments. So things will get cheaper with time. And of course, competition is crucial here as in any sphere of life, healthy collaborative competition between Da Vinci and other manufacturers. I'm probably pretty confident we'll, we'll bring the costs down. Um, yeah. Now, of course, you know, when you look at the results that we have for um, uh, for a Heinz fingerplasty, yes, I mean, the, the benefit of the robot above and beyond a standard approach is modest. I'd say, you know, I'm being perfectly honest here. I think it's modest. When one looks, for example, at the Martini unit in Germany who are doing exclusive robotic prostatectomies, and their um, improvement in terms of morbidity and functionality post-robotic post prostatectomy, I think that evidence is quite convincing and is, is, is probably a magnitude greater than the, the differential that we're seeing here in cleft surgery. So, uh, and of course, in, unless we explore these things, I don't think we'll ever know. You know, as a surgical trainee, I, I always learned how to do open appendicectomies. We've all been frustrated when, you know, the registrar in general surgery is wanting to do a, a laparoscopic appendicectomy because it takes three times as long. But of course, you know, um, uh, laparoscopic surgery uh, has been a new dawn in general surgery and other fields of surgery, of course. So it, it's, it's a really delicate, um, a delicate balance. And I think your point, Tim, is really pertinent when it comes to benefits, particularly in the primary sphere, because at the moment, we don't even have consensus globally on how we do primary repairs, whether it's um, the age or the technique, the sequence, um, the, uh, whether we use loops or microscope or, or, you know, there's so much variance in what we do. It's impossibly complicated to compare outcomes in cleft surgery because of this variance. And of course, introducing robotics is just one more um, confounder to that analysis. And that's why I think it, I'm really excited uh, to hear what um, uh, the Antwerp uh, outcomes will be, because I think uh, uh, that's important, an important part of the, of the story for primary surgery. And for me, I'm perhaps sufficiently a Luddite, I'm perhaps sufficiently anxious about um, robotics that I would want to see that primary outcome result in children before I'd be persuaded to abandon 
the, 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 the microscope and the, the standard sum lead approach, because I think the results of that approach are by and large excellent. That, that's uh, that's really helpful because it move, move, moves us into a lot of areas that we're getting questions that are coming in, Mark. So uh, I don't know whether yeah. James wants to pick up on some of those, but I'm particularly intrigued. There's one we've had about um, training uh, and and that the business of this learning curve. You mentioned the learning curve and how difficult it is for you with a limited number of patients to, to, to do this. Is there an argument? Are we moving? I, I, I'm, I'm very convinced, actually, that eventually the, the visual uh, uh, improvement that we'll get from using the, the robot in a baby will, be, will, will actually drive a lot of primary palate repairs to, to, to ro robotics when we've got it. And it's just a matter of technological time uh, mm -hmm. to do that. But uh, there may be a case for centralizing more cases and because of the expense of the, the kit. Uh, but what about how do people learn how to, to, to use a robot? pretty tricky and, uh, and certainly well, you know most um most big centers most big hospitals um uh in the uk europe and and certainly in the developed world will have a robot because it is leading the charge certainly from the urological and gynecological uh, perspectives and in other fields of surgery and we're no different tim you know we've had to beg, borrow, and steal the robot from our urological colleagues. They get first dibs on the robot, and we use it when they don't have a, a case. So, you know, and at the moment, as it stands, as a department, we couldn't afford our own robot. But the robot sits idle for much of the week, and you're, um, you know, as a trainee with appropriate supervision, there is no reason why you couldn't use that robot with the training instruments um, using uh, a mannequin model or uh, a, the beautiful um, Simulaire uh, cleft palate model developed by the Sick Kids group, I think it's really going to be invaluable. And of course, it can be recorded, it can be critiqued, much in the way as, as microscope um, work can be recorded or laparoscopic work can be recorded. And I think for the trainee, there is great utility in that. And certainly in, in, in plastic surgery, where the metrics of plastic surgery are so vague in terms of training, I think this is actually um, a real big step forward for that. Um, so I, I, I think for training, it's a, um, a, real, a real winner. So Mark, if I may ask then for, for the um, budding cleft surgeons in the audience, do, do you advise that they try and get some, some um, practice throughout their registrar years, um, coming up to consultancy, just so, so that, you know, I always find it, the, the, the important parallels to, for example, learning a musical instrument. If you want to be a professional instrumentalist, you do not start at the age of 35. You start before you're 10. And I yeah. wonder whether these motor skills ought to be actually developed right from medical school. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, you know, make the joke that, you know, I, as a teenager, had, you know, Pac-Man and very basic Atari um, type games. Um, I was not, you know, on, you know, complex video games and I, you know, I wasn't of that ilk and I definitely started uh, too late in the tooth or too long in the tooth with this technology. And I think our trainees will be absolutely charging with this in the future. And I, if I was a trainee who's interested in, in robotics, as in anything, I'd say go and see the experts. I'm not an expert, but I'd say, you know, if you can, if you're out in the States, Go and see um, Weinstein. Um, uh, he's a very um, a good host. You'll see Transall uh, uh, robotic ENT surgery there. Go and see NASA in Antwerp. He would be very welcome of, of um, people to come across. Go and see your urologist. There will be a urologist in your region who will be using the robot. And you can get used to a lot um, uh, from, from just joining them in theatre, getting used to the complexities of the setup this concept of divorcing the operating surgeon at the, at the um, console to the, the assistant surgeon at the, at the patient's uh, uh, head side or, 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 or bedside. And um, so there is scope to get involved. And the um, Social Intuitive, who are the company who um, obviously uh, own Da Vinci, they are rightly cautious about allowing people to use this technology. I think we're technology has gone wrong in the past because that people have gone on a course and they've just, you know, um, gone willy-nilly and perhaps stepped um, 
um, uh, or began to, to run before they were able to walk. And I think da Vinci are very careful about making sure that prospective surgeons are trained. And uh, for that, you have, there is a training program through da Vinci. You don't need to be a consultant for that. You can start them as a registrar. And you have to be mentored. And we were very lucky to be mentored by one of our head and neck surgeons in Oxford. And that um, mentoring and training process is very important, whether you're a, you know, uh, an older, less dexterous uh, IT savvy consultant such as myself, or you know, a more dynamic trainee such as Tom, for example. So you know, we, we have a range of skills, but the training program is, is, is well thought out. And um, I would encourage anyone who's keen to explore this further to go and visit somebody. And we'd be very happy to have visitors as well in Oxford. Of course. I think that's a very great, a really important message, Mark. Do not go out there and just have a go at this uh, with your local, uh, wherever you are. Don't, don't think you can have a look and do it. Uh, it, it it's a process of learning. Mark, a very quick uh, question that, that you can answer very quickly. Somebody's asked, who is operating the 3D camera? Is it the surgeon at the console or another surgeon? And how is it operated? Is it a foot switch? So simple, yeah. simple answer, technically. Yeah. Very, very good question. So the console surgeon has full control of the instruments at the patient's head. So the a foot switch, uh, a foot paddle moves the, um, the camera. So you can zoom in and out, you can rotate the camera. Um, and your finger gimbals um, operate the instruments. So um, you're in complete control as a console surgeon. Yet your um, the secondary surgeon, your assistant surgeon at the head end, is there to ensure that you're not colliding with any important pieces of anatomy, and is also there to add in all the things that the the Da Vinci can't give you, such as a sucker, such as a, a malleable retractor, and to do all those other things. So you you're still very reliant on that secondary surgeon. So well, just a quick follow up on that. Somebody else has asked. Uh, it, you can't always have another surgeon, skilled surgeon, operating with you. Can could the scrub nurse be uh, th that person who who, who assists? There's a, a no, no. So this 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 is where um, this comes back to the training aspect, which I just mentioned, and the the the, the protocol that Da Vinci have is that this is a two man operation. Okay, so you have to have two trained surgeons who are taking responsibility for this patient. One is unscrubbed, the console surgeon, one is scrubbed, who's at the head end. Um, so no, you couldn't, um, at the current time, you couldn't have a scrub nurse or a medical student or someone else um, at the head end. Th that job is too important and too critical, not to say that a medical student or a scrub nurse isn't capable of that, but they haven't had the training. And if you go on the Da Vinci training algorithm, uh, the course, it's multiple courses, um, you, will, you will appreciate the importance of the communication between those two people. And you still need uh, a very um, skilled scrub nurse who is da Vinci trained. The scrub nurse is also da Vinci trained, who can pass you the instruments, who knows how to um, uh, avoid clashes with this very com complex um, instrument so you are still reliant on the scrub nurse but not as a, not as the assistant surgeon Mark, the, um, I wanted to ask you I was I've only seen the da Vinci a couple of times um, but I was interested to hear that there's no bipolar diathermy no sucker no spin hook um, so have you ever had a situation where you wish you had a bipolar diathermy for example and, and how would yeah. you get those tricky situations yeah, I mean, of course, as plastic surgeons, you know, if you look at a primary palate repair, the, you know, my initial anxiety about the Da Vinci was A, not having a knife, okay, using scissors. I don't use scissors to the muscle protection. I don't know many surgeons other than, uh, other than David Fisher. I don't know many surgeons who do use scissors largely for the uh, palate muscle dissection. Um, uh, and also uh, monopolar. I'd be very anxious about using monopolar around the, the base of your levator pedicle for all the reasons that we understand as surgeons. Um, <clears throat> of course, those issues aren't such a problem with, with um, a Heinz fingerplasty. But of course, if you, if you um, and we have had bleeders, of course, you know, little um, uh, pharyngeal vessels, um, uh, rather than just frying the whole thing with the monopolar, we tend to grab the vessel using the Maryland 
and then just just buzz it as as one would um, uh, using any normal monopolar, just buzzing the instrument to 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 coagulate the vessel. So yes, it it it, it takes getting used to, but it, it's certainly not a, a problem. The monopolar instrument is really beautiful. It's got a, a curved tip to it. And it's absolutely beautiful to sweep away for blood deception. It really is fantastic. And for ra raising Heinz flaps, it's, um, it is an absolute pleasure uh, to use it. So, um, and of course we missed the skin hook, as you said, but the, the Mary Land, those, those tooth forceps um, can, can uh, act as your retractors. So, so it's different. It's just a different way of doing things. Um, and um, with a bit of practice, it becomes, it's not, I wouldn't say it's second nature for me, but it, it becomes a lot easier. Now, Mark, you're an experienced cleft surgeon. Uh, and you've had patients who've bled unexpectedly and uh, anybody can encounter this sort of thing. Uh, a couple of, couple of queries. One is, somebody has actually said, um, d is there ever gonna be a time when the robot will finish the job for you and, and sort things out? So you, you're talking about the clever suturing, but the other, perhaps more pertinent to now is, is there a time when you you will need to convert to a non-robotic procedure you know pull everything out and just jump in and, and so so what are what are the pitfalls of cleft uh, palate uh, pharyngoplasty surgery or anything in the back of the throat you know what what, what can go wrong and, and what would you do what, 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 what are the pitfalls is there yeah. a mortality rate for pharyngoplasty still that you know of? so sorry what was that last bit tim is there a mortality rate published for uh, well, I mean uh, I mean we, I mean there is a mortality rate for fringoplasty of course I mean it is it vanishingly low to the extent that I wouldn't um, in, a, in a standard patient I wouldn't um, consent them for death as a fringoplasty maybe one should but I don't of course there is a mor morbidity uh, that morbidity is largely the immediate side is airway and bleeding um, and in the um, uh, and of course the sort of short-term complications would be dehiscence and and all the stamp infection and the standard sort of surgical things and long-term of course is obstructive sleep apnea particularly with an obstructive uh, fringoplasty um, and I don't think that's any different from a robot uh, than it would be with a standard approach we going back to your issue about an interoperative bleed that is always our concern and we've all done fringoplasties where you've hit a you know a large vessel uh, coursing across the, the posterior um, uh, pharyngeal wall, whether that be a vein or, or a, a, a branch of the pharyngeal plexus, um, uh, an arterial bleeder. And as part of our sort of SOP of doing robotic cleft surgery was that if we're in that scenario and we lose control, you can immediately remove the robot in, in a fraction of a second. You can lift the whole head unit away and then you're converting to a, um, uh, effectively a standard operation. And that's, of course, where your secondary surgeon is quite important because, of course, they at least need to be able to tamponade the bleeding with a swab or a finger until you as the console surgeon, if you're the surgeon who's, who's so, uh, ultimately responsible for that patient, can get scrubbed and then join the party. So, so yes, I think bleeding is the, the prime um, uh, concern that we had. We never had any significant bleeding. We we're probably lucky. We probably haven't done enough of them to, 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 to get a significant bleeder. What I what I, I think is interesting is when you look at, um, for example, NASA's presentation on robotic surgery in the primary scenario, he does his closures um, with loops because he's more, he's probably more comfortable with loops. That's what we've always done. Uh, whether you're a loop surgeon or a microscope surgeon, that's 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 your default setting, and of course it's quicker. Um, stitching uh, uh, with loops or a microscope than it currently is with a the robot. There's no question about that. The, the robot is more cumbersome in that regard. Uh, and that's why I, I deeply um, uh, 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 encourage one of the current uh, listeners here to perhaps take that on as a project. Um, other risks, Tim, would be in primary surgery, I think would be an inadvertent tear. I think, you know, particularly uh, um, in NASA's um, scenario, he was doing uh, furloughs. For all of us who've done furloughs, you know, your cuts sometimes don't go quite where you want them. You make a tear in the nasal layer. And I think you can quite easily get yourself in a muddle. If you're in that scenario as a rookie robotic surgeon, I think you should probably bail out 
and and return to what you're more comfortable with particularly when you're having to suture in in um uh, in very flimsy tissue because you lack that haptic feedback with the robot so um i think if you're if you're in a tricky sort of salvage situation i would probably urge uh returning to what you're most familiar with okay and just for the there are trainees watching uh, uh people coming up to their exam what are the key blood vessels that uh, you might Hit. Where, 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 where do you want to be on the lookout for with pharyngoplasty and with your palate repair? What, what, what do you? Well, the, for the, the, the message for the trainees here is that the, the, the elephant in the room, as far as a Heinz pharyngoplasty um, uh, is concerned, is the, the carotid artery, um, uh, specifically in patients who've got 22Q deletion syndrome, because your internal carotids are more immediately are more medially sighted and so when you're doing these lateral flaps in your tonsillar pillars you are millimeters away from um, uh, uh, an encounter an unexpected encounter with a carotid artery now um, uh, I know Tim um, uh, and uh, um, many surgeons me included uh, would routinely uh, scan patients preoperatively to determine uh, MRI scan, you can also have a, if you've got a competent um, a head and neck ultrasound uh, uh, radiographer, uh, you can use ultrasound to determine the uh, carotid anatomy in these children. Although I have to say there is a school of thought, and my colleague Guy Thor Thorburn in Oxford uh, sits in this camp, that actually once you've got your gag in and the patient's asleep on the table, you can feel where the carotids are. And there are certainly scenarios with 22Q patients where you go in there wanting to do a Heinz ringoplasty, but the carotid is too medial and it's too risky, too superficial as well. Um, uh, and you would, um, you would abandon a Heinz procedure in that scenario and you would, um, uh, for example, use a midline pharyngeal flap. And of course, you'd have that discussion with the family preoperatively so yes that that for me is the uh is the is the prime issue that you need to be aware of for the examination although tim as an old hand surgeon he's come across i've seen old op notes of his where he's come across aber aberrant branches of ascending pharyngeal arteries and as well as odd nerves tim as well you've found over over the time haven't you um, yeah. Yeah. yeah so you know you you never quite know what you're going to find particularly in the syndromic uh, in the syndromic uh, um, cohort, yeah, yeah, but the carotids is where you need to be careful. Yeah, I think I think we all need to be aware that uh, that, that clefting is part of very frequently part of anomalous uh, other structures uh, and they're, they're syndromes which, which exist and sometimes we've not picked up the syndrome and and there's a problem there. Are there any more questions, James, that we haven't been through? Uh, there have been some super questions coming up on the on the chat. I did have one question, and I wanted to play devil's advocate for, for a moment here, Mark, which is, if I were the patient's um, parent, or indeed if I were a hospital manager, and you're saying that you wanted to do this robotic um, surgery on the yeah. child that will take, a, you know, an hour and a half longer with good results, but, you know, comparable to a traditional technique, and it's going to cost the hospital in excess of a million pounds in running costs and so on, what what do you say to that well i i mean i accept that argument and and i try to provide um counters to that argument in in my talk of course if you were fervently adherent to that philosophy james you'd never have laparoscopic surgery in your in your hospital you know you'd never have made these absolutely um uh, you know, Herculean leaps within surgery. You have to accept that there is some um, uh, gradual evolution in surgical principles, which, which will come at a cost in terms of expensive equipment, in terms of training, potentially in terms of increased morbidity initially. Yeah. Um, but you, you have to explore those avenues, otherwise we'll never move forward as surgeons. Yeah. And I accept in, in Heinz Ringoplasty that you know, the, the benefit is modest. Um, and based on that, I'm not sure I would get Oxford United Hospitals to fork out two million pounds for an extra robot just for the cleft service. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, 
in other spheres where they are more advanced in their in their in their knowledge and their use of robots um, the costs for t1 t2 tumors in the head and neck for prostatectomy uh, uh, cases the cost is is um, a, a positive return for robotic surgery and in many units globally the robot is the is the go-to operation from that yeah. so yes uh, i think it's important that we all play devil's advocate um and in part that's why i'm a little bit um on the fence with regards to primary surgery because i want to i know our outcomes with primary surgeries is are so good at the moment i would not I want to be certain that we can at least achieve that with a robot before we advocate it to the global cleft community. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I think you have to accept that we 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 we've we've got to you know we've got to push forward with technology. Otherwise, you know, you, we're you, you, you very much see and believe that with technological advances, eventually it will supersede what we can do with our own two human hands. <laughs> I mean, you, you, it, for anyone who sees that a robotic operation uh, firsthand and you see the, this ability for the endo wrist to achieve movement in a space that is not possible with the most talented ambidextrous surgeon cannot achieve that. There has got to be utility for that technology. Of course, there has got to be utility. Um, and, and there's no doubt in my mind that we will, we will move forward with that. Um, and you only have to go and see the Weinsteins of this world operate, uh, and for that matter, to see some of uh, NASA's um, uh, videos to be persuaded that you can reach a very, very high level of surgical attainment with this approach. And there are other, other advantages associated with it. For example, I think, I think for training, I think it's far better than what we can achieve through, through the operating microscope or through loops um, for training registrar. And I think there are certain scenarios where the robot is head and shoulders better than um, um, uh, the standard approach. And that's where a lot of surgeons you'll be recognizing in cleft hyperextend the neck, which has its risks. Um, the old fashioned rose position, I mean, the, the child's head is virtually off the theater table in the patient's lap. But there are scenarios, one of our patients, for example, had a C-spine fusion uh, so they weren't able to hyperextend their neck. So it would have been quite difficult to do a standard uh, Heinz in them. We've all got patients who've got Pierre Robin sequence with um, trismus, poor mouth opening, big tonsils, all these obstructions to a standard Heinz fingerplasty can be circumvented, I think, with the robot. So there are loads of exciting avenues that we can um, push with the robotic approach. Yeah. You have picked up one of the questions was about whether this was a be more benefit for the surgeon or the or the patient in, in and you said outcomes are roughly the same for you at the moment for the technique you're using but you know you and I know very well uh, several of the UK cleft fraternity who've had cervical spine uh, serious cervical spine problems with their with their operating so that's uh, but we know uh, I mean I know Andrew Hodges was watching and, and uh, has been using prism loops for a long time um, so that was it. And another question that you might just pick up on is, uh, is it the same robot that's used for different specialties? Is it, <clears throat> which yeah. I know for, for yeah. you, uh, it is, yeah. but uh, are there, you know, we're going to see divergence in, in robots as we've got different microscopes. ENT never used the same microscope as us. So what, what, your comments on those two things? Yeah, that's that's very, a very good point. Uh, a couple of things from that, Tim. Firstly, for the trainees out there, if you're starting a career or potential career in cleft, I do not think you should be using normal loops for that. You will end up with C-spine problems in your, in your later years. You should either use the prismatic loops or a, a microscope. I think for the benefit for the surgeon is, is, is clear in my view on that regard. With regards to the robot, yes, Tim, we use the SI or the XI robot is the same robot that we use um, for um, uh, plastic versus ENT versus urology, an identical uh, bit of kit. Um, the difference comes in the instruments. So yes, we prefer to use the smaller five mil instruments if we can, because of course you've got less, um, uh, got less room to deal with um, 
uh, in, a, uh, in, in a transoral approach. Don't forget for a prostate, you're going into different parts of the, the abdomen pelvis. So the instruments are all very distally uh, spaced, whilst orally you're all having to go through a tiny cavity. So there's more clutter. So smaller instruments are more helpful. And I'm really pleased to see that other companies are developing other instruments. So for example, the Toronto group, uh, uh, in Sujiti in Toronto um, uh, are doing some excellent research looking at other suturing techniques, um, a robotic knife uh, rather than reliant on, on blood dissection and, and, and uh, monopolar. And yeah, so instruments will evolve, of course. And instruments can only evolve if we get people in, in that field. So the more people we get doing robotic plastic surgery of various guises, um, the, the better things will come for us, for sure. Yeah. James, over to you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. That was a tour de force. Thank you so much, Mark and Tim, for spending your time today with us. Um, thank you, thank you to everyone for listening. Um, so, so that's it, really. Um, just to let people know, I wanted to share the screen, um, my screen here. So, Mark, if you don't mind unsharing your screen, please. Unshare. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's great. And I, I just wanted to show um, people about some of the upcoming um, talks that we have. Uh, let me just see if I can share the screen. And you need to give us the poll results as well, James. Oh, oh did I? Sorry, apologies. Oh. And Whilst you're on there, it'd be good for, a, there must be some enthusiasts out there. So Mark, it would be, I'm sure you, so. um, you know, even if there's a handful of, of uh, trainees or others who, who would like to get involved, um, it, do, do make contact. It's, um, they, yeah. they're a group of interest in, this will be, this is something for the future, I'm sure. Yeah, and uh, all trainees would be hugely welcome to join us in Oxford. Of course, these procedures are not frequent. Of course, they are not going to happen during covid uh, uh, we're barely going to be able to get our primary cases done, but you are very, very welcome to visit and see. Um, uh, but don't don't miss the opportunity to combine it with a trip to to Europe uh, to see um, NASA's work or the United States. Uh, there's lots of great stuff going on uh, around the world. So, but do see it because I think you'll be um, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Great. Did you see the results there, Mark? Yeah, yeah. interesting. So I'm, I'm pleased that 15% of people have seen it. That's, that's fabulous. And, yeah. and two people, 2%, one person uses it regularly. Super. Um, so just to share the screen. Great, can you see that? So we've got a few things coming up. So um, on Wednesday, the 8th of July, we have a superstar studded um, panel on congenital hands on syndactyly. Um, is a journal club, what we, um, what we call the phronesis journal club, um, dedicated to debating hand and orthoplastic conditions. And we'll be discussing a recent paper by Chuck Goldfarb um, out in the US on his outcomes of pediatrics in dactyly repair using synthetic dermal substitute. Um, and then the, um, um, in a couple of weeks, we have Professor Lin from the Changung, who was the first person who did a bilateral forearm transplantation and first arm transplantation in Taiwan, talking to us about his experience of vascularized composite alley transplantation. We also have a few other webinars coming up in the um, um, next few weeks, with um, months. Um, Ted Lin, again from Chang Gong, talking about venous flaps. Natasha Van Ziel um, from Australia talking about her experience of nerve transfers for tetraplegia and of course she um, um, she published her landmark paper in the Lancet at the end of last year um, and so here they are um, and there will be a few more coming up in the next few weeks and we'll let you know by Twitter or on Facebook so thanks for that that's the end of my plug and I hope everybody have a, have a great day thank you Thank you. Thank you, James.